I'm going to finally try to wrap up this whole thing that I've been babbling about for the last six months about training frequency and injuries and just training in general by answering uh, actually a real Q&A rather than one of my made up ones that gives me an excuse to hear my own voice for 45 minutes. It does admittedly relate obliquely to the topic, but I, I, I will tie it in, I promise. So first off, and um, make sure you have a drink or something, here's the question. <gasps> Whenever I hear discussion or debate on volume recommendations for hypertrophy, people typically talk about what the research shows as optimal or builds the most muscle. Specifically, the phrase builds more muscle seems to nearly always be used to mean that higher volumes will build you more muscle relative to genetic potential in the long run, but the research time frame I am aware of have all been less than six months. Am I missing something obvious, or should the volume research instead only be talked about with respect to higher volumes potentially building muscle faster over the study time period? Practically speaking, do you have any thoughts on whether lower volume programs and higher volume programs ultimately can get one to the same end point but just do so at different speeds, or is, or is there evidence that higher volumes actually do build more muscle overall and are necessary to reach your genetic potential? And good God, that's a mouthful. And I'm sure I could have shortened it up, but I'm just too damn lazy. But what it basically amounts to is, when people make these talk about these optimal volumes and high volumes and this and that and the other in terms of generating more growth, don't we really need to, to limit that to the overall time frame of the study? Can we necessarily extrapolate and go, well, this will, will get you, this will keep occurring over endless amounts of time, or is it possible that just using more sane volumes and ignoring the Instagram bullshit will still get you to the same point of a genetic limit, albeit a little bit slower? And the short answer is, yeah, a thousand times yes, I agree with what this person is saying. But now, because it's me, let's look at the long answer. In science, when you're a real scientist, I don't mean a bro scientist like these other guys, you do not extrapolate from limited data. If a study is only eight weeks, and let's say, let's say that it shows higher volumes are better than lower, or lower volumes are better than higher, whatever it is, and that study is eight weeks, at best, you can conclude that over the duration of this study, in the population group study, which could be untrained, which that study, those research is irrelevant, moderately trained, well-trained, the age of the people, whether they're male or female, over that time period, this volume was shown to be such and such a percentage, superior or inferior based on the statistical methods used. Traditionally, that's been p-value, and there's issues with that. Um, you know, Bayesian statistic, BF10, which uh, only seem to really matter when it's studies you don't like, like in Brad Schoenfeld's study, the BF10 values didn't support their data, but that seemed, didn't seem to matter every to anyone. But if it, if it supports or doesn't support data they don't like, suddenly those values are really important. Lately, there has been a, a big push to use effect sizes, which is arguably better than probably either. And I won't try to explain that because I'll do a bad job of it. And it's important to realize that usually the results are being uh, provided on average. So they take all the people and they average them up and then they compare those averages. And averaging has its own set of problems. Because when you start to look at the individual data, if you actually read the paper, which of course the talking heads on the fitness industry don't ever show, unless you're me, and they certainly don't talk about, and they know that the people that follow them aren't gonna go read the papers, you see huge variation. So like, here's, good God, here's the low vol, here's the higher volume group, and here's the lower volume group. And you'll see that some of the low volume group get more growth than some of the high volume group, right? But then some of the, higher volume group get more growth than the lower volume group and it's the average that you're looking at and so the average ends up a little bit higher and that's what they report. Oh, there's greater growth from 16 sets. Well, on average, in some people, except the ones that grew better on lower volumes, which never gets discussed, which becomes a bigger problem because now we know that there are hyper and hypo responders to training. Studies have started to have people act as their own controls. So rather than compare two groups, this group does 16 sets, this group does eight. They'll have one person do 16 sets on one arm or leg and eight sets on the other and compare them to themselves. And what you find is that in hyper-responders, they get great growth from either volume. And the hypo-responders get shit growth from both volumes. And there's more variance in the hyper-responders between Sorry, there's less variance in the hyper-responders between the two different interventions than there is between the hyper and hypo-responders. Which means that if, by accident, 
one of the volume groups in a hypertrophy study happens to pull a few hyperresponders, they're going to pull the average up. And frequently when you look at the data, you'll see this big cluster, and then there'll be this one motherfucker way up here that pulls the average up. And then when you take them out, they're usually a lot more similar than ever gets reported. Now, it gets more complicated. You can get way deep into the data and go, well, a certain percentage of people got more growth. And this data from the Norwegian Frequency Project that everybody has a hard on for sort of illustrates that, right? Like, so look at the squat, right? There's kind of a cluster of data for three days versus six. And yes, more people on average got better results with six, but some got less. And there's one dude who got fucking freak show results. For bench press, the cluster's a lot closer with some of the guys in three days getting more than the six, but on average more got more results out of the six, and it, you can see that in all the other graphs. And I'm not saying this is right or wrong or good or bad, I'm just pointing out that like when you're only presenting averages, it tends to obscure the details, because newsflash, all of you listening to this are not an average, you're an individual, and the individual results are what are far more important. Like you can parse this a lot of different ways, I'm simply pointing out some of the issues with what science actually finds and how it's actually presented. And as far as the hyperresponders, we can't identify hyperresponders ahead of time. It's only after the fact. Oh, this motherfucker grew like crazy. He was a hyperresponder. So again, if by accident, because we all know researchers, scientists aren't biased and you can trust them, right, Brad? Trust, trust, yes, Jesus Christ, trust. Right, that's why you don't have to blind, because people can trust you, for fuck's sake. Or never had to blind until you changed your mind recently. All it takes. But again, that's not how the data is ever presented. It's always presented as, this volume caused this much greater growth than this over... That's it. Because nuance is lost, and doesn't provide for pithy Instagram memes. Hypothetical example. Uh, you take 20, 24-year-old males which have moderate training experience, which, make no mistake, that means nothing. You've been in the gym as long as I have, which is 30 years professionally <clears throat> and 40 years training. You know that the number of years someone's been training doesn't mean shit. You can train for 10 years and still have shitty technique and train with no intensity. You can train for a year and be a monster. You have to use something as a cutoff, but those values don't mean anything. Yes, some studies will measure maximum squat strength in terms of body weight to get a better indicator, and that's fine. But again, I've watched people squat. Most of y'all can't squat worth a fucking shit, technically. Regardless, 16 sets versus 8 sets over 8 weeks. And if you're wondering why exercise science studies are typically so short in America, it's because they run on the university system which most schools run semesters, UCLA ran quarters, which means you've got a 10-week span for a quarter or longer for a semester to do your study. So you've got to plan it, mark it out, get your subjects, do the study, and then do the analysis within that semester. So it's limited in time. So anyway, you give this and you do whatever measurements, ultrasound generally, which is sensitive to a whole lot of things, which I'll come back to, and you get your results you know, assuming that the assessor is blinded, unless he's bred, because then he can't be biased and you can trust him. Jesus. And uh, you find that on average, the 16 set group gets 2.5% more growth, statistically significant, the P value BF10 when you pretend those numbers matter effect sizes, than the others. Great. If you were to read the actual study and read the conclusion or the application if you're reading JSCR, it will flat out say, this study has found that in this population of this age, with this training status, this generates this result within statistical significance. And that's it, because that's all science, science, can actually conclude. And they'll also usually say something to the effect of, because of the population studied, we cannot generalize this to untrained individuals, older individuals, females, etc., etc., over longer periods of time, because that study showed what that study showed, which is what that study showed, and nothing more. That's important because frequently when you do finally study those other population groups, you see discordant results. Frequently what works in younger individuals doesn't extrapolate to older individuals and vice versa, which is why when guys like Menno put up these papers where they studied 76-year-old men and generalizes to everyone, well, these aren't real scientists. These are social media influencers and make no mistake about that. Same thing, generally with untrained individuals, doesn't matter what you do, they get the same results. You cannot generalize from untrained individuals to trained individuals. And in 99.999% of cases, animal research never translates. So fuck animal research. 
I was aimed at you, Chris, because you love those untrained studies. You love those studies in animals to draw your conclusions. And then you let Paul Carter echo them. Moving on. And then if you go read the Instagram post, all that shit gets left out. Higher volumes are better and generate 2.5% better growth. That's all that gets reported. Because the details, the nuance, don't provide insta pithy Instagram memes or edgelord Instagram memes. And these exercise scientists online, i.e. the modern bro scientists, know that if they were to present the nuanced data, they couldn't draw those strong conclusions. And they also know that the people following them won't go read the papers unless they're me. And then I present the reality, and then they block me because they're all cowards. I digress. My long-winded point being that what actual real science can conclude is very limited to what was done. And yet somehow that always seems to be different than how it gets presented online, unless you're watching my overly long videos. Now let's look at a not-so-hypothetical example. It's a very real-world example, right? Since people still think of me as the keto guy for reasons, because of my first fucking book however many years ago, they'll frequently ask, what are the long-term effects of keto diets? And I'll say, well, we don't know. The longest data that I have seen, and again, I haven't looked into this very recently, was about three years, and that was in epileptic children, which is not necessarily a good model for adults dieting uh, for a number of reasons, not only being that they're adolescents, and also the, the way the diet is set up for epilepsy is very different than for fat loss. So my, my only legitimate answer that I can give is, I don't know. We only have data out to such and such a time. Now, does that mean that it will have negative effects or positive effects over long periods of time? We don't know. That's the only honest answer to give, and that's the answer that I will give. I mean, I wish we knew. I mean, this is a problem with science, right? The study can only be as long as it is. And, you know, another approach is they'll frequently follow people over 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. God damn, the Framingham study has been going on since the 70s, tracking people, but that has its own set of problems. They send people questionnaires about what you're eating, and they bring them in for health stuff, and it gives that long-term data, but it's very uncontrolled or it's less controlled than diet intervention. So this is a limitation of science and the scientific method until we get, as I predict in the future, uh, biosensors in the body that will simply track all this crap and be able to measure your diet and ketones and health and all this stuff. And then every month we'll just go get the barcode, barcode scan and they'll put it on the computer and analyze it, probably once the AIs have taken over. But until that point, Science is limited by the duration of the studies, the group being studied, the intervention, how well they adhere to the adventure, intervention, which is often absolute shite to begin with, and any honest scientific conclusion by a real scientist will only be exactly what the study did and found, along with limitations and the fact that you should not be extrapolating this to any other population or any other situation. And yet that's not what we generally see. Again, I can be as guilty of this as everyone else, but it is still a problem. Moving on. So with that overlong introduction out of the way, back to the original question, which is, can we necessarily extrapolate the results of these relatively short-term studies over longer periods of time? Once again, the short answer is, no, we can't, but there's still more to the long answer. Just because something does something over eight weeks, or 12 weeks, or 16 weeks, and honestly, I can't think of many of these studies that are even six months long. Okay, that's not true. I think those Barbalho uh, glute bridge studies were six months long, but it's really easy to do a lengthy study when you're making up your fucking data in the first place. Does not mean you can draw conclusions over the long term. It might apply or it might not. You simply don't know. I'm not saying it does or it doesn't. I'm saying you can't know. And drawing global conclusions about what might be optimal volume is forever and ever and ever, or what volume is superior or inferior forever and ever and ever, based on a short-term study, given the limitations of science, the limitations of who it's being done in, and the fact that despite this shit being claimed to go to failure, we all know it's not, which is why these motherfuckers won't video it because they don't want the truth to come out. No, you can't draw this conclusion. So here are a couple of examples where this really went wrong from the 2000s, which was when high-intensity interval training really sort of came to the forefront. I mean, never mind that I've been writing about it since 1998, the industry usually takes about a decade to catch up with me. But because of a couple of studies and interest in this, interval training got blown way the fuck out of proportion. 
I imagine a lot of you are familiar with something called the Tabata Protocol. It was invented, bizarrely enough, by an ice speed skating coach. And I, I really need to do a video on, on how weird that sport is because I keep bringing it up as an example. And the coach's name, either the coach's name was Tabata or the guy that researched it was Tabata. I forget specifically. But it was a protocol where you performed eight repetitions of 20 seconds all out. And by all out, I mean at 170% of your VO2 max wattage. Like, massive, like truly super maximal, alternated with 10 seconds of easier recovery. And you did eight total repeats of this. So it was a four minute protocol after warm up and with cool down and stuff. And what it had generally found was that the nature of it, which just happens to mimic ice speed skating and the way you skate laps, again, different video, stressed both the anaerobic and the aerobic pathways and caused some pretty major adaptations in both. And so they had one group do traditional aerobic training it's like an hour or five times a week. Sorry, I'm not looking at the paper because I don't give a fuck enough. The other group did the Tabata protocol four times a week and then one steady state uh, aerobic session in the middle of the week. And this was about the time that all the interval work was starting to break and everyone had a hard on for high intensity interval training and fat loss. And this is when, you know, turbulence training and all that shit, the 2000 circle jerk of Alan Cosgrove and Jimmy Moore and all those other motherfuckers were cranking this, this bullshit out. But anyway, here's what the study found. It found that over three weeks, the Tabata protocol generated improvements in both anaerobic capacity and VO2 max that were significantly higher than the standard aerobic group. Great. And everyone concluded, see, Tabata, Tabata, Tabata. Just do Tabata all the fucking time. But you can't conclude that. You can conclude that over three weeks it does. And if you actually looked at the data, because the study was six weeks, over the next three weeks, the Tabata protocol stopped generating improvements. It was three weeks of greatness and then three weeks of jack shit. But that didn't stop everybody from going, oh, just do intervals all the time. This study shows the interval is superior. Well, for three weeks. And there were other studies like this. So there were several in cyclists. Now realize, uh, athletes have been doing interval training for decades. It was just about the time that it really started to be studied in a scientific sense, trying to optimize in terms of frequencies and durations and all that stuff. So like, it was nothing new from an applied standpoint. It was just scientists, they need something to keep themselves off the dole. So here's another example of this. They're all fairly typical, right? So one of the earlier ones, they took fairly well-trained cyclists who had been riding, whatever, 300 kilometers per week, some ungodly amount. And they replaced like 15% of their total training volume with interval training. And in one of the first studies, they had them do it was like two interval sessions for three straight weeks and so six total interval sessions, or maybe it's three a week for two weeks. It doesn't matter. They did six total sessions. And they saw this really drastic increase in peak power output and time trial performance and, and all that stuff, which again, was consistent with what the, the athletes had found. So once again, that very well might lead to the conclusion that CC intervals are better, or at least doing some volume of intervals as part of your overall orbit training is better, better, better. Let's see, two to three weeks is, um, well, it's only part of the year. And I mean, check my math on this, but like there are, uh, carry the zero, 49 to 50 other fucking weeks a year. Based on what I said earlier in the video, is it safe to extrapolate from this one study using six total interval sessions to longer periods of time? Well, based on that, we don't know. Maybe it helps, maybe it doesn't. But then there was a second study, and it did a similar thing, replaced 15% of their 300 kilometers per week of training, but they either did six interval sessions or 12 total interval sessions. So basically three weeks or six weeks of two interval sessions per week. They measured all the same stuff as the earlier study. So it's basically a replication, but seeing what happened if you did twice as many intervals. What happened? Because what they found was that, yes, the athletes got this huge improvement with the first six interval sessions and then jack crap doing six more stating after four to six interval set training sessions two to three weeks peak power output was typically increased by an average of 15 to 20 watts however increasing the number of HIIT sessions to 12 had no significant further effect on the cyclist peak sustained power output adding although there was no improvement in the cyclist 40 kilometer time trial speed with only three interval training sessions Time trial performance was significantly enhanced after six HIT workouts. Typically, cyclists improved their 40-kilometer time trial speed by blah, 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 blah. It appears that increasing the number of HIT sessions from 6 to 12 does not result in any further improvement in cycling performance. Indeed, most of the HIT-induced improvements in both peak power output and 40-kilometer time trial performance appear to be completed after only six HIT sessions. That's pretty clear-cut. In the one three-week study, yeah, six sessions worked great. 
And if you were dumb and didn't understand science, like people in the 2000s, you would conclude that, oh, intervals, 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 because that's exactly what they advocated. But then you look at the follow-up study, and it shows that intervals, great bang for the buck for about three weeks. And then you get no further results other than extra fatigue and workouts that the average person isn't going to do. And this brings me the very long way back to the original question to talk about the hypertrophy issue. What is happening is what this person was asking about. Is people are going from these short-term studies and assuming, well, this, this happens forever. So you can probably see where this is going. These studies that are part of the endless volume wars that as we flip-flop back and forth, right? Brad's study came out, everybody jumped on the volume train. I said it was bullshit. I did a complete analysis of the volume studies to date and showed that on average they still suggested 10 to 20 because Brad misrepresented statistics and all his little sycophants backed his bullshit until five years later. They all walked it back and were saying 10 to 20 sets again. And then the next high volume study came out and they all jumped on its dick. And we went right back to that. And then they started to walk it back again. And then the bullshit 52 set study came out. That's where little Milo Wolf got all butt hurt over me like the little baby that he is. And at best, right? Well, let me go back. I did an analysis of that 52 set study. The one that was like, see, there's no such thing as joke volume. And Milo's like, if you can't do 52 sets a week, maybe you don't know how to train. Blah, blah, blah. I fucking hate this industry. So I did it back. I love this industry. I detest the people in it. But in love this industry, I wouldn't be doing these videos to try to fix the problems. It's the people I don't like. Now, now I did a long video looking at that study in detail, showing what was actually said and actually done. And it's interesting how it was not what how it was ever presented that I ever saw. And so, uh, for example, yes, the researchers acknowledged that while well, growth was slightly higher in the highest volume group the increase paled in comparison to the, the amount of time that it, it took to do that workout. The return on investment was absolute shit. There was the fact left out that the highest volume that 52 weeks, that's only two weeks of the study. They ramped them up every two weeks from 20, right? So it's not like you can even fucking conclude 52 sets is optimal. They did that for two weeks. That got left out. There was the fact that it was in quadriceps only. And this, no one ever seems to have, have addressed my question. Even if 52 sets per week were optimal, which the study did not support. How do you apply that to the entire body? There are, depending on how you want to count it, eight or nine major muscle groups. Chest, back, delts, biceps, triceps, quadriceps, hamstrings, glutes, and calves if you give a shit. Are you going to do 450 hard sets per week based on this? This is the same industry that says that three sets to failure causes excessive neuromuscular fatigue, yet they jump on this bullshit uncritically. Hmm, funny that. These are all issues with this study that got left out of all the Instagram bullshit as people blathered about this. You can go find that video. I put up the screenshots of all of this so you can see what was actually done and what actually happened. And go compare that to how they reported on it. And you might learn a valuable lesson about why you shouldn't listen to those morons. Practically, was this study interesting? Sure, science is always interesting. Was it worth changing the entire training paradigm because a God, bunch of goddamn Instagram gurus had shit to sell? No, because at best, at best, that study showed that over eight weeks, you could ramp people up to these high volumes, massive volumes, and they got a slightly greater growth increase for investing two and a half times the duration in a single muscle group, which precludes doing jack shit for anything else. To go, to ask the question, you know, is high volume right for you is not the right conclusion. And yet that's what happens. And then the next study comes out that's low volume, everybody jumps back because you got to generate content every week. Now, me, I've been saying the same goddamn thing since 2002. But again, let me try to get back to the original question. Let's say for the sake of argument that that 52 set study is correct. Let's say that working up to massive fucking volumes, 52 sets per week, generates more growth. Now, I probably personally don't think it does, because I think what we're going to find out once they finally do the, 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 base, uh, the basic science is that all we're measuring is water shifts. That's my prediction. I could be very wrong about that, but <clears throat> I won't be. Uh, 
we know that massive volumes cause massive inflammation and fluid shifts, and I can almost guarantee, as a, again, a video I did, it's going to end up being water shifts, not real growth, because you simply can't get that much real growth in the, the short time periods of these studies. But let's assume that it was. Let's assume that doing two and a half times as long of a workout did generate slightly more growth over those 12 weeks. Okay, now let's see if I check my math, uh, 52 weeks in a year minus 12. That leaves 40 weeks out of the year. So here's a question. What the fuck are you supposed to do for the rest of the year, guys? Are you going to maintain 52 sets? Even the researchers said that everybody in the highest volume group was real tired at the end. Even little Milo Wolf, and he left this out of his reports, talked about having to take fucking ice baths the night after he did sort of did that workout as part of my challenge. Now, no, he didn't build up to it, and maybe that would have changed it. Even if, even if, and this is a big if, the results of this, that slight increase of growth, from this highest volume were true. You can't do that year-round. You can't. You can't. The researchers never suggested that you could, and yet all the Instagram people reported it exactly like that. Now, they might have said it explicitly, but they sure didn't say the opposite. By the time I saw the fucking, there's no such thing as junk volume. Well, that makes it sound like the more volume, the better all the time. That's not the conclusion of the fucking study. Milo Wolf, is high volume right for you? No, you fucking moron, because it was a short-term study, and even you wouldn't be able to survive that volume in the long term. Because nobody can. So even if, even if the growth was real, and maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Like I said, I'll be proven right. Trust me. He said, altogether too smugly. We'll see how bad my hubris is. Even if it could be done for the whole body, which it can't, unless you want to do 450 fucking hard sets a week. It's only for two weeks of the study. What do you do the rest of the fucking year, guys? Why is this never being addressed? If interval training craps the bed in terms of progress after two to three weeks, what the fuck do you do the rest of the year? Why can't supposed scientists with supposed degrees, even they're from utterly shitty universities, not know better than this when they talk about these things. If you're going to claim to be a fucking training expert and pretend you know goddamn anything, you need to explain what do people do the rest of the fucking year? Or you need to be able to explain why you think the results of these relatively short-term studies can or cannot or do or do not apply to a long-term training career. Because at the end of the day, what's happening in these short-term studies is a small part of the picture. Let's go back to reality and forget that's for the sake of the example bullshit. Go back to the original question again. The answer to the first part of it is that no, you can't assume that these results are going to continue in the long term, especially at the highest volumes. Even when you look at it, even when people like Krieger are occasionally honest, and it's funny, they, they play by different rules depending on where they're writing. So he writes his volume Bible, which Jesus pretentious much, and he's whatever his analysis of it or one of his early review papers is, it's like, yeah, if you go from three sets at a workout to six sets at a workout, you double the volume, but you certainly don't get double the growth. There is, again, there's a, 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 an asymptotic increase. The return on investment is not linear, at least not outside of a certain range. And I think in that piece he wrote that, you know, five sets per workout kind of gave was the minimum to get growth and 10 was kind of the maximum, which is interesting because Brad's paper, which he defended so vigorously before he blocked me like the coward that he is, Use 15 sets, and somehow, check my math, but 15 is, is more than 10. I mean, he did kind of go, well, if you're using short rest intervals, you need more volume to, to make sure that he covered his ass. And that's not wrong, but somewhere between 5 and 10 sets. 10 sets does not give double the volume. Of it doesn't. And even his, when he's being honest, analysis shows that. So we, we go to the second part of this guy's question, which is, isn't it possible, or might it not even be better, to simply work at lower volumes? and possibly accept a slightly slower rate of growth per unit time over longer periods of time, because training careers are not generally short-term. I will give an exception to those. And the answer, of course, is yes. If you're looking at the long term, if you're looking at four years of training, it takes about three to four years, assuming you train perfectly from day one, and nobody does, to reach your genetic limit. Whether you do it with massive volumes to get you double your training, you get that much more growth. 
We'll do it with less volumes over longer periods of time and repeated cycles. You get to the same fucking point. Maybe, maybe you get there a tiny bit faster with the higher volumes, although I'm going to qualify that. But maybe you don't. Because in some cases, as I'm going to show you or argue, you might get there slower. Regardless, a genetic limit is a genetic limit. You still reach the same place. Mike Isertel's blathering in our debate notwithstanding. So, well, maybe if you get a little more growth early on, you can eke out more at the end. That's not what a genetic limit is, Mr. Exercise Scientist. The only limit Mike understands is the limitations to his fucking bodybuilding career because he's an abject failure. Genetic limit is a genetic limit is a genetic limit, unless you take all of Mike's drugs. Then you can surpass your genetic limit. But then you don't escalate your training volume, you escalate your doses. And you still look like shit on stage. And then you blame the tanning company because you're a weak-minded baby. But I digress. You are going to get to the same place in terms of your upper genetic limit of muscle mass. No matter what you do, assuming you're doing sufficient volume and intensity and applying progressive overload, which is more important than all this crapola. In fact, I'm going to make an argument that you're more likely to get to your genetic limit training more rationally with more moderate volumes. And make no mistake, I've promoted the same 10 to 20 optimal volumes, although I tend to fall somewhere midpoint. You're going to get to the same place. And now I'm going to explain why I think you're more likely to get to that genetic limit by avoiding super high, high volume. Now, I did another video on a while back. Powerlifting is, is a much easier sport in many ways to coach in that it's very objective. You know if the training is working or not in a way that you don't for bodybuilding frequently. The athlete either gets stronger or doesn't. They either put more weight on the bar or they don't. It's very objective, right? Whereas bodybuilding is very subjective, which is, there's another video, go watch it on my channel. Uh, I was, it has to do with why I think powerlifters frequently grow better than, than bodybuilders. It's got to do with that objectivity. Either more weight goes on the bar or it doesn't. Now, because of that, Powerlifters are trying to add weight to their total, to each lift, squat, bench, deadlift, if they do all three, whatever. Now, Matt Gary, who I bring up a lot because he's great. I love, I don't listen to fitness podcasts because they bore the shit out of me, including my own, but I'll listen to what he has to say because his information is fantastic. And one of the points that he made, it has to do with longevity in the sport because High-frequency power, powerlifting, like I was talking about, without a lot of intensity cycling, tends to break people. And what good is adding 25 kilos to your total over 12 weeks if you then retire because you're injured? And that's frequently what happens. So what he said, he said he would get these questions. Some, get, some kid comes and goes, hey, Matt, can you add 25 kilos to my total in eight weeks? And Matt would tell him, well, yeah, maybe, probably, but it'll probably break you and you'll quit afterward. Which, if someone just wants to do one competition, is great. But if you're looking at long-term, if you're looking at career longevity, that doesn't work. So, I use my powerlifter as an example, or actually the two others that I train. My goal with her, and she competed four times a year when, when the competitions were available, my goal was to add Two and a half kilos to each lift at every meet. Seven and a half kilos to her total per meet. Now realize, smaller female, the poundage is, like relative to her poundages, that, trust me, that was significant. Because over four meets, well, that's 10 kilos per event. That's 30 kilos to her total. And if I can keep that up over eight years, that adds up. But by taking that conservative approach, by never trying to overload her and use super maximal high volume double Russian shock cycle bullshit, she didn't get injured. Actually, most of her injuries were outside the gym <laughs> with ridiculous stuff. I mean, she had minor, minor stuff happens, but she had no major injuries during her entire career. In fact, in eight years of training her six days a week most of the time, she missed exactly two workouts. And those were both workouts that I called for a couple of different reasons, because I kept her healthy. I kept her uninjured. I never buried her in volume, so she was never exhausted. And there's a lesson here. Because I would much rather go for the small gains every 11 to 13 week training cycle and just keep repeating those because over time they add up. I mean, I could have. I could have thrown her into the grinder. I could have said, all right, we're going for it. This meat, we're going to go for 10 kilos per lift. And I probably would have injured her. And it would have ended her career. Or 
I get, you know, now, now not everyone can compete four times a year. I'm not saying do that. I'm not saying this is descriptive, not prescriptive, right? I'm trying to make a fucking point because you will see people that go, they're going to go to one meet a year and they're like, I gotta, gotta make these huge jumps. I gotta add 10 kilos to every lift because I got a PR. Of course, in that situation, if you're only going to compete once a year, you can do four individual training cycles to get those gains. You don't try to do it in one gigantic cycle unless you do something dumb like fuck off for three quarters of the year and then at the last minute try to jump into training. So it still kind of comes out in the wash. But again, I'm making a, a, a principle argument here about avoiding trying to get these monstrous gains every cycle when you can just make smaller gains and keep repeating the cycle over and over and over again and get to the same, if not actually a superior place, for reasons I'm going to explain here in a second. The point I'm trying to make being that going for those massive short-term gains, while it might work, is just as likely to get someone hurt, burnt out, and then their career's over. So what the fuck good did that do? I knew I could eke two and a half kilos out of every lift for her every 13 weeks. And over eight years, it added the fuck up including her final deadlift, which was 391 pounds at 114, nearly three and a half times body weight. It's more than most of y'all lift, so get fucked. I did it without hurting her. I did it without burning her out, because I took the gradual and the long-term approach. Back to hypertrophy. Which hopefully makes the point, and made no mistake, I did the same thing with her hypertrophy training and that she just tried to make small progressive increases at moderate volumes. She usually did about 15 sets per week, although that varied depending on when she, where she was in, in, uh, in the year. Um, small PRs, every cycle over a span of eight years, it adds up. Because I will argue, and I'll be right, that from a long-term perspective, you are actually going to be better off training at more reasonable volumes and doing repeated cycles where you're making progress than trying to throw these massively high volumes at your training, which even if they do generate slightly better short-term results, assuming they do, assuming it's not just water and inflammation, which it will turn out to be most likely in my opinion, that shit burns you out. Even if it is effective over 8, 12, 16 weeks, you have the rest of the fucking year. And trust me, coming out of that 52 set week, you're going to be wrecked. So even if that two and a half times greater volume gives you two and a half percent more growth or whatever the fuck it was, when you can't train for shit for the next eight, 10, 12 weeks because you're exhausted and you're sick of spending your life in the gym pursuing this moronic hobby based on the advice of a bunch of people who do not give a shit about your best interests, you will make less gains because whatever small increase you made with that massive fucking volume will be offset by the 12 weeks you don't spend in the gym because you're burnt out or injured, because that's what happens, especially if you're not being coached and don't have someone to tell you to knock the shit off. So again, little Milo didn't seem to present the 52 sets as it was only two weeks. Because if you can't do 52 sets a week, you don't know how to train. Fuck you. Fuck you, you little edgelord moron. Insecure little baby, because anyone that would mandate you call them doctor when you got a universe, got a degree from that shitty university is an insecure child. You can't do that long term. Anymore, you can do high frequency, high intensity long term. It gets people hurt. And unless you have a coach to tell you to knock that shit off because they were doing it for the short term for very specific periods and very specific purposes, people get hurt and getting hurt doesn't get you better progress. So not only are the results of these studies probably bullshit, they can only, even if they're not, they can only be extrapolated over a short term period. 8, 12, 16 weeks. Good scientists would take that into account. But these are not good scientists on Instagram. These are fitness influencers with bullshit letters after their name. You cannot extrapolate in the long term from a short-term study. And if you're looking at someone's long-term training career, telling them to double or triple their volume to get that much more maybe growth because of this one short-term study when they have their lives, and hopefully better lives than living in the fucking gym, they will get to the exact same place over the long term. In fact, I will still argue they're more likely to get to their genetic limit because they won't get burnt out or hurt and fucking quit because this advice is fucking stupid. So I agree with what the guy asked. Now again, do I typically, uh, you know, yes, I still sort of promote those optimal volumes, that 10 to 20, but five sets, a workout, eight sets, 
you know, I don't think I've ever pushed 20 for the grand majority of people. Not if they're working hard. You cannot do 10 true sets to fail. You can do 10 bullshit sets, and that's what's being done in these studies. But somewhere in that range depends on the muscle group, the exercise, the person, the body part, uh, the proximity to zero reps and reserve, shit like that. But in a general sense, yeah, doing five sets versus 10 gets you a little bit less short-term growth, and in the long term, you get to the same place. And I say you're more likely to get to the same place because you won't get hurt, burnt out, or quit this dumb bullshit. And that's how this ties very obliquely into that injury issue. There's no benefit to any type of training, high volume, high frequency, any of it. There is no benefit to it if it gets you fucking hurt. Because once again, being hurt, in my experience, is a lot worse for gains than training like a rational human being and just being happy with those short-term progressive results over and over and over again because you're better off getting 5% every 12 weeks, four times a year, and then take a couple weeks off to give yourself a break, than trying to squeeze out 7.5% over 12 weeks by tripling your volume and getting hurt and then not being able to train for six months. You will get further with the first approach than the second. I'll finish up with two more things, including an exception. Before wrapping up, I do want to make the point that there is one legitimate exception to everything that I've said. There are occasions where someone only has a very short term to get the most gains that they can, and then you may have to throw them in the grinder. So early in my career, for example, I had a guy come to me, he was a baseball player, and they were sending to the Japan leagues, and he had six weeks to get into shape. So I gave him one week break in, and then I did push him a lot harder over the next five weeks than I normally would have. But that was time limited, and I was coaching him. See my last video. That was a very specific situation where I could push him harder than I normally would because I had to get the most out of him that he could get in a very short period of time. Did I bury him in volume or intensity? No, because I still couldn't fucking break him, but I did push him harder than normal. Uh, at some point, and this is on my website, I will describe, uh, I might put myself once through absolute, a grinder of a training cycle. Because I had six weeks when I decided to switch from inline to ice speed skating to get my leg strength back, because I had not been lifting. But it was a specifically delimited cycle specifically short-term period, I had this long to make the maximum gains that I could. But it was a training that could not be sustained in the long term. Nor should it be. I mean, it couldn't have been. It would have broken me. It almost did anyway, and only through some real careful cycling was I able to avoid getting hurt. So those are a couple specific examples. What about hypertrophy? Would there ever be an exception to all my blather where possibly doing one of these more on high volume, whatever approaches that get you this much more growth for this much more effort be worth it. Yeah, I can think of one. Like if I had somebody come to me that wanted to do a bodybuilding show or physique show and they said, look, I've got a couple of weak body parts. I'm starting my contest diet in eight weeks and I need to bring them up to as great a degree as possible before I start contest prep or I'm not going to gain any muscle. I would consider a type of training that would be in excess of what I'd normally do, right? They came to me and said, hey, in two years I want to do a show. I would just do the way I always do. I would use moderate, what I consider proper volumes over the long term, repeated cycles, because they're going to get to the same place without getting hurt. But in that rare occasion where they said, I got eight weeks to bring up two muscle groups before I start my diet so I can be competitive on stage, I would use something a little bit different. But those are very specific examples. Although, to be honest, I still would do any of this moron high-volume bullshit. I just put them on a specialization cycle like I always do, which works, and that would be perfectly fine. But I'm just, someone will bring up this weird exception or this one possibility, but there's still better ways to do it that don't fucking wreck the person. But that would be a rare exception. Bulls. And the reality is that the grand majority of you who are reading this shit on Instagram by Mike and Lane and Brett and Menno and Little Milo Wolf and all these other people, 
y'all aren't competitive fucking bodybuilders. And like I said in the previous videos with this high frequency bullshit and all this other crap, adding 5% to suck is still suck, right? There are better things to do with your time in life than live in the weight room pursuing this dumb little hobby. And if you're going to get to basically the same place doing half as much work and actually training properly, which none of you all are when you're doing these massive volumes, you're all training like Mike Isratel, which is to say a big baby, but without his drugs you don't grow, you're wasting your time. You are. But of course, none of these Instagram talking heads would ever say this to you. Because if they told you, stop listening to me and just go do moderate volumes until you get as big as you want to be so you can be jacked at the bar, you will tune out and you will stop reading their shit, which means they can't sell you product. Because that's all they care about. Me, I don't give a fuck, because all my books are about diet anyway. So I'm happy to say this and tell you to find better things to do with your time than 52 fucking sets for quads that will get you no more growth, no more meaningful growth than if you just did... 10 hard sets a week. Hard set. And will factually probably get you less growth in the long run because after you finish that moronic shit, you're going to take two months off because you're burnt out or in. Which let me bring, finish up with one more topic. I want to finish up with kind of a, a another, it's going to be a teaser. It's a video or maybe even a book project that I, I'm going to do. I've ranted about this in my, in my group anyway. But, which is that this whole volume debate is asking the wrong question. Because it's not just about the volumes of training and the sets or the reps or any of this other bullshit. Because something that seems to have been forgotten among the supposed exercise scientists with their fancy degrees is what is kindergarten level exercise physiology, which is the inner relationship between frequency, intensity, time, or volume in this case, and type of exercise. To talk about volumes in isolation from those other factors means nothing, any more than to talk about intensity or type of exercise. Or, vol or any of that, or frequency. You cannot talk about them in isolation. I've done videos about this before. Find them on the channel fucking somewhere. And so that's problem number one. But problem number two is, again, it's asking the wrong question. Because you can do 10 sets of 10 pissing the fuck about, i.e. training like Mike Isertel at 10 reps in reserve. And that may be less of a growth stimulus than four all-out sets of eight. Period. It's just that simple because they are asking the wrong question in terms of what is the optimal volume for growth. It's not about sets, sets, it's not about reps. And yes, I'm sure Greg Knuckles will do an 18-hour video. I well, if you assume that they're all hard sets, we only count hard sets, they're a failure. And yes, that's absolutely true. But I guarantee you that these studies using squats, high reps, or short rests are not to failure, no matter what you fucking think. And technical and volitional failure don't count. Go listen to my other videos. The wrong question is being asked. But I'm not going to tell you what the right question is till I decide to do something with it. And I have something to fucking sell you. The difference being that what I have to sell will be correct and actually useful. Because it will explain how what the possible optimal volume may be depends on those other variables of frequency, intensity, and type of exercise. And that different volumes may be optimal under different conditions. But until I have something to sell, you don't get the fucking answer, so eat me. summing up. Number one, you cannot extrapolate to the long term from a short term study on anything. Clearly I'm not in the interval training studies where intervals crap out after two to three weeks and you have to do something the rest of the fucking year. Not from a short term training study regardless of what it does. Maybe high volumes do cause greater growth over short terms when you're measuring water shifts to begin with. But what do you do the rest of the year? Does tripling your volume to get a slightly greater growth get you further in the long term than if you were simply to train at more reasonable volumes and train intensely, which most people don't, and be progressive in terms of adding weight to the bar over time, which most people don't? No. Not only will those high volumes not get you to your genetic limits or past them any more than a moderate training volume would, the argument that they might get you a little bit there a little bit faster is probably exactly backwards because you can't do those massive volumes all the fucking time. And I would argue that they're less likely to get you to your limits because when you try to do that ridiculous shit, you end up burnt out or injured. And that will get you far less long-term results because that 2.5% you gained over 16 weeks is offset by the 8 weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks you took off 
because you fucked up your knee listening to Instagram dipshits. So to answer the question that was originally asked, I agree with everything you said. And now you know the long answer why. Since I keep bringing her up and showed you her awesome final deadlift video this time, I wanted to announce that my trainee Sumi Singh has a new book out titled Becoming a Mentally Tough Motherfucker. How Elite Powerlifting Made Me a Better Person, Parent, and Partner, with both a foreword and epilogue by yours truly, which is a guide to all of the mental training skills she developed over the eight years of her incredible elite powerlifting career. Topics include goal setting, dealing with resistance, setbacks, failures, journaling, anxiety on the big day if you do compete or have some sort of big demonstration or event, and also what to do when you choke, among many, many, many other things. It's currently available for pre-order at the low, low price of $7.99 on Amazon.com, and I'll put the link in the notes. If you are in a different country, you will have to go to your specific Amazon and search on her name, which is Sumi Singh, S-U-M-I-S-I-N-G-H. You will not be able to get it from Amazon.com unless you're in the United States for Amazon reason. And in some countries, you can't pre-order it anyway. You do not have to have a Kindle to get it. You need some sort of Kindle reader, and Amazon does have a cloud Kindle reader to read it on the website. So if you don't have the device, don't worry about it. If you pre-order it now, low, low price of $7.99, get it before it goes up. It will be sent immediately to you when it is published on August 8th. Buy it. Buy it now, tell your friends, tell your enemies, tell everyone, and maybe consider sending a gift copy to Mike Isratel, because he needs help becoming mentally tough, because he is a weak-minded, excuse-making motherfucker who apparently doesn't know how to get a tan after a decade and a half of competing. Buy Simi's book. You won't regret it. For the record, I neither read nor respond to comments on YouTube or Instagram, because I don't care. Mind you, I don't delete comments I don't like, like most of the weak-minded babies in this industry either. If you think my content is great and want to tell me how awesome I am, fantastic. If you think I'm a dumb asshole and want to call me names, also fantastic. I don't care either way, because I have better things to do. If you have questions that you want me to potentially read and or respond to, or most likely ignore, send them to questions at bodyrecomposition.com. Might get to them. Might not. It's part of my charm. Oh yeah, I recently added a playlist to my channel, my buddy Solomon Nelson, uh, who does some fantastic uh, videos taking down the cretins in this industry. I've put the link directly to that playlist in the uh, video comments, and you can also find them however you find playlists. He deserves the exposure. Go check him out.